in the beginning of the 17th century, amidst the backdrop of exploration and ruthless competition, a harsh man living in a harsh era, rose to shape the destiny of empires and rewrite the story of trade and power in the East Indies. Meet Jan Pietersoon Cohen, a daring Dutchman with ambition and a hunger for power and dominance. Cohen's journey wasn't smooth sailing, it was a perilous voyage of storms, rivalries, and bloody, infamous confrontations in the uncharted horizons. But through it all, he saw beyond the challenges, envisioning a legacy that would echo through history. Born in Horn in 1587, he was raised in a strict Calvinist family and had a good education. In 1601, he went to Rome and got trained as an accountant, and in 1606 he joined the newly formed Dutch East India Company, VOC, which had an exclusive charter and power of state to trade in spice in Spiceland east of Cape Town. And in 1607, he set sail for the first time in the uncharted waters of the East Indies to claim his fortune. This was the time when the Dutch Republic, freed from the Spanish yoke and relishing its freedom and prosperity, with its great city of Amsterdam, became the center of international trade in exotic luxuries, especially from the Spice Islands. The 13,000 islands that make up the Indonesian archipelago, spattered like stars in the night sky, are spread out over 5,000 square kilometers of sea. Situated on the equator, it has high levels of heat and humidity and volcanically rich soil, which makes it suitable for the generation of rare spices. The western islands of Java and Sumatra, which grew pepper, ginger, cinnamon, and resinous camphor, dominated the spice trade through the Malacca and Sunda Straits. The second spice-producing zone was the famous Malacca's area, which comprises five of these little islands west of Halmahera, ruled over by the Ternate and Tidor Sultanates, it has the right climate and soil for growing cloves. Further to the south, in the lonely expanse of the Banda Sea, are the tiny Banda Islands, the sole home of the elusive nutmeg tree, which supplied the world with nutmeg and mace. Soon after the opening of the new direct European maritime route to the Indian Ocean through the Cape, the Portuguese captured Malacca in 1511, and started dominating the intercontinental spice trade, including their control over the spice islands, by setting up factories in Ambonia, Ternate, and other places in the Moluccas. And until the end of the 16th century, they enjoyed the upper hand in the spice trade and reaped enormous benefits. But in the last decade of the 16th century, the Dutch, flush with idle capital, and inspired by unprecedented victories in their lengthy war of independence against the mighty Spain-Portugal combined empire, plus hearing tales of fabulous wealth in the east, saw an excellent opportunity to trade directly with the spice lands. Dutch capitalism developed from the Low Countries' decentralized commercial and financial infrastructure, which encouraged interregional trade and rivalry. The Dutch joined the East India Trade War in the late 16th century, first because the Iberian crown prohibited Asian commodities from entering the Dutch Republic, and secondly because the Republic's primary rivals, Portugal and England, were undercapitalized, as the Portuguese crown had centralized the East India trade, stretching its resources while the English crown had discouraged investors with its predatory borrowing. The Dutch merchants made their debut in the risky venture into the east with the first expedition in 1595, and within a few years, Dutch ships swarmed the Spice Islands, making Bantam their operation base in the east, which was a leading peeper exporter and had a strategic location on Java's northwestern coastline, along its control of the Sunda Strait. The Bantam port polity represents contemporary Indonesian archipelago political systems that were the reaction product of increased Indian Ocean trade in the 15th century and the Portuguese seizure of Malacca in 1511. It suited the other European and Muslim visitors who were hesitant to cross the Malacca Strait, due to the increased Portuguese military presence. Due to oversupply, spice prices crashed in Amsterdam. Therefore, in 1602, eliminating competition among themselves, the Dutch State General combined all companies into one joint stock entity, the Dutch East India Company, that is, VOC, with a monopoly of trading and waging war for their successful trades. Unlike the state-sponsored Portuguese and English, the Dutch were independent enterprises funded by abundant private capital and were not risk-averse. The spice trade was also vital for winning the war against the mighty Spain-Portugal combined empire. Accordingly, they looted the Portuguese ships in the east, the weaker partner of the Iberian Empire, because they professed a monopoly of east trade based on ancient papal proclamations. 
but the Calvinist Dutch denounced it, and they claimed a legitimate right to trade based on legal treaties with local rulers. They quickly outmaneuvered the Portuguese in the spice trade on the spice islands of the Moluccas due to their organizational inefficiencies, corruption, private trading, and the scarcity of able men. However, the Portuguese were not the only obstacle. After many failures in finding a short northwest Arctic ice route to the Pacific Ocean and then to the Moluccas, Sir Francis Drake, the English freebooter, followed the Magellan blueprint and crossed the Pacific, reached Ternate, the center of the Moluccas, and returned to London full of spices in 1577, inspiring Elizabethan England to believe the East was a land of fabulous potentates. Further, James Lancaster's disastrous first journey in 1591 and his immensely successful second journey in 1601 through the Cape Route after founding the East India Company in 1600, set the spice race in motion. But the Dutch took the lead in the beginning, leaving England behind and thoroughly beating the Portuguese. Dutch ships discovered the lively Banda Islands in 1599 while searching for spice beyond Bantam, where they traded mace and nutmeg on the island for cotton and weapons. When another Dutch ship arrived in 1602, the relationship turned political, as some Bandanese Arankayas, the rich representative merchants, were ready to create an alliance against the Portuguese. Initially, VOC's military and political ambitions were limited as they were interested in treaties that excluded European competitors, but soon they discovered that it was not possible without force. In 1605, the VOC defeated the Portuguese in Amban, their first territorial possession, and got clothes buying rights exclusively for the VOC on a fixed charge. Two years later, they built a fort on Ternate to protect the Sultan from Spanish threats. The VOC thus became a political and military organization with forts, soldiers, and local friends. The Bandanese were different, not that naive, and much more experienced in handling outsiders. In 1605, the Dutch convinced most Banda villages, except Lontor, to sign a contract for the exclusive rights to buy cloves, nutmeg, and mace to monopolize these spices. But the Dutch were infuriated when they found that this monopoly was feeble on the ground. Several Banda tribes traded with other merchants, especially the English, who also began arriving in the Moluccas. The Dutch found the political scene perplexing. Thus, the VOC started fantasizing about controlling the Banda Islands by force. In the spring of 1609, Admiral Peter Verhoef, the battle-hardened leader, landed on Banda Island with 1,000 men, including Japanese mercenaries, and Lord Seventeen's corporate order to conquer the Spice Islands, either by negotiation or force. Sailing with the voyage was a junior trader named Jan Pietasun Cohen who witnessed the Bandanese treachery of 1609 and would soon go on to historical greatness as well as infamy. Peter Verhoef summoned all the local chieftains, the Arankayas, to a meeting. He admonished them for breaking their earlier promise to trade only with the Dutch, and went on to explain that he intended to construct a castle on Nera Island to defend them from the Portuguese. And he started digging the foundations on the site of an abandoned Portuguese fort. The Arankayas watched with alarm, and on May 22, they asked for a meeting. Verhoef immediately agreed to meet with them, but they misled Verhoef and his team, caught them in deadly traps without arms, and treacherously massacred all 40 Dutchmen, inciting a general Bandanese uprising. The Dutch quickly elected Simon Hohen as their new leader, who immediately raised the blood flag and pursued all retaliation methods including bombarding, burning villages, wrecking ships, and murdering Nera islanders. On August 10, 1609, a peace contract was signed with a small group of Arankayas, transferring Nera island to the Dutch. This was the Dutch's first East Indies acquisition, and soon other islands would follow. They also committed to only selling their nuts and mace to the Hollanders. Hohen immediately asked Captain Keeling of the English ships stationed there to leave the Banda Isles and never return, initiating the long-drawn English-Dutch conflict in the Banda region. Young Cohen's ideas of natives and English treachery sharpened over the horrific voyage. After returning to the Republic in 1610, he submitted a report on trade possibilities in Southeast Asia to the company's directors, which helped them conclude that it would benefit both the company and the Republic by hurting Spain's economy, weakening its military, and countering England in the East trade. Cohen wanted the company to monopolize cloves, mace, 
and nutmeg in their isolated origins by artificially restricting supply and maintaining high prices worldwide. Cohen's shrewd analysis impressed the directors. He was promoted to senior merchant in 1612 and was asked to sail again in the entourage of the new governor general, Peter Both, as in charge of two ships. Further, Both, overwhelmed with Cohen's fervor, dedication, and clear understanding of the company's operations, appointed him as director of commerce at Bantam, where he produced his famous treatise, The Discourse on the State of India, a report on the company's affairs, and submitted it to the Lord Twelve in 1614, which promoted him to the position of director general, the second highest rank in the spiceries. But a lot was still to be done. Cohen has to professionalize the company's business activities in Bantam and on the island of Amban prosecuting anyone who dared to challenge the VOC monopoly as best he can. The Banda Island's remoteness, small size, and position as the world's only nutmeg supplier propelled the Dutch to secure the monopoly. But the English were equally interested. Two minor islands, Ari and Run, had not signed VOC's monopoly agreements and traded freely with the English. In 1615, Governor-General Gerard Rains deployed over 1,000 company troops to Ari, but the Bandanese, who possessed English guns and training, defeated them. Never recovering from humiliation, Reince died months later. Cohen raged and wrote to the Council of Seventeen, which promptly sent a bigger fleet to seize the island again. The English company cowed and left the island Ari, leaving people in Cohen's savage, suffocating grip. Now, Cohen's rage is concentrated on Run, the only nutmeg-producing island, that was free from the Dutch. With a powerful fleet in the east, Cohen envisioned the company's operations throughout the region, including Macau, with VOC monopolies over cloves, mace, and nutmeg ruthlessly enforcing and artificially restricting supply and keeping prices high. Then Dutch colonists with slave labor could start commercially restricting farming, accruing vast profits for the company. It was an absurdly ambitious vision, beguilingly wide in scope. However, Lord Seventeen was induced into this intoxicating scheme, overlooking the unsavory, unspecified violence needed to secure it. But some major problems had to be fixed before it could be implemented. Cohen got the opportunity in October 1617, when Lawrence Reel resigned in protest of his low pay and Cohen's increasing importance. Cohen was the obvious choice for the next governor-general, and at the age of 31, Cohen took charge on April 30th. 1618. After more than a decade of war and numerous agreements, VOC was still on a shaky foundation. At Amban and the Banda Islands, locals continued to flout signed monopoly agreements and secretly trade with English and other merchants. Therefore, when Portuguese prisoners escaped from a VOC ship and sought protection in the English company's fort at Bantam in 1618, this caused an open rift in the fragile peace between the Dutch and English, and they began to skirmish with each other in the streets of Bantam. Cohen had always hated Bantam for its cloyingness, so when the Sultan of Bantam asked him to stop fighting with the English there, Cohen ordered the removal of his headquarters from Bantam to 80 kilometers east along the same coast, to the little town of Jakarta, where he was welcomed by the local prince. But Cohen had not been in Jakarta for long when he ordered a small English factory in the city burned and destroyed. Then, unexpectedly, Sir Thomas Dale's English East India Company's eleven ships' fleet surfaced, which blocked Cohen's seven ships in the port and demanded Cohen's surrender. Although he was outmanned, Cohen refused, and after several days, several cannons were, and naval warfare began between the two companies on January 7, 1619. The English company's fleet was fighting the VOC's ships. When three more English ships arrived the next morning, Cohen ordered the men in his Jakarta factory to defend the depot to the death and then gave the signal for his ships to turn and flee. Nevertheless, things went from bad to good for Cohen. Sir Thomas Dale, feckless, unfocused, and unable to unify the independent captains of his fleet, allowed Cohen to escape to Ambonia and then bungled the assault on the fort. Dale directed his ships not to hunt down the remnants of Cohen's shattered fleet. Instead, he headed to the coast of India, where he died a few months later. After successfully holding off English attackers on March 2, the men of the VOC garrison named their little fortress Batavia, as Holland used to be called in days of antiquity. In May, a more organized Cohen returned in triumph to Jakarta. 
he marched with a thousand fresh troops into the fortress and, on May 28, 1619, ordered them to attack. The local prince was stunned at the unexpected treachery. Cohen conquered Jakarta, burned down most of its buildings, and seized it for the VOC. He then drew up plans for a new settlement based on the traditional Dutch model for the capital in the East Indies. He then systematically attacked the dispersed English company ships, capturing seven for his own use, effectively ending the English company's challenge in Indonesia. But, Cohen received the worst news of his career on July 17, 1619 that he must desist in his attack on the English company's shipping. As part of an agreement between the two national governments in Europe to forgive and forget previous hostilities, the two companies expected to work jointly to expel the Portuguese and Spanish and to maintain their forts and factories. Cohen was not going to follow the deal as he had some leeway in interpreting orders received from Europe, where communication may take a year. He constructed a united fleet of defense in Batavia, where he reluctantly allowed English agents to operate. On January 1, 1621, Cohen suggested his long-delayed Banda Islands invasion at a combined council meeting, asking the English to contribute a third of the soldiers and ships when most of their ships were already at sea. English showed no interest. As per plan, Cohen decided to follow his own path without them. In February 1621, with 13 fleet ships, dozens of smaller craft, and nearly 2,000 troops, Including a small contingent of Japanese mercenaries, Cohen arrived at Fort Nassau on Great Banda Island. He suspected, correctly, that many disaffected English were helping the Bandanese prepare in the mountains for the impending invasion. Cohen launched his attack by ordering a small ship to circle the island in order to draw fire so that he could determine the location of gun emplacements. A few days later, VOC troops began the assault. It was not easy, as Great Banda consisted of densely forested, inaccessible mountains and had become the focal point for Bandanese resistance to the VOC hegemony, drawing fighters from the other islands. After two days of fierce fighting along the crags and ridges, Cohen bribed several turncoats with bags of 30 gold coins each to betray their comrades and undermine the defenses of the island. His company's troops then quickly seized control of most of the island's defenses. With only six dead and 27 wounded, Cohen took over the entire island, with enormous casualties for the defenders. A small group of Orang Kaya surrendered to Cohen. He asked them to surrender all their weapons, destroy all defensive forts, and give him all their sons to be held as hostages aboard his ships. They would agree to cede sovereignty over all the islands, donate a tenth of all the nutmeg they produced each year to the governor-general and sell the remaining 90% to the VOC at pre-arranged low prices. In return, Cohen promised to protect them from their enemies, presumably meaning not himself but the Portuguese. But the majority of Orang Kaya's remained hidden in the mountains, delivering neither additional hostages nor weapons and attacking Dutch patrols. Cohen was waiting for just such an event as a pretext to completely crush them. Cohen ordered the torture for confession of the 45 surrendered Orang Kaya, convicted them of treason, and sentenced them to death without a proper trial. Japanese soldiers, with their sharp swords, beheaded them. The Orang Kaya died silently without uttering any sound except that one of them, speaking in the Dutch tongue, said, Sirs, have you no mercy? Cohen continued ethnic cleansing in the Banda Islands. Over the next few months, VOC troops burned and razed communities, herded the captives aboard ships, and took them to Batavia for slavery. Out of the 13,000 to 15,000 original residents, only 1,000 survived on the Banda Islands. Later, several hundred were enslaved to work on plantations. Cohen captured all the English and their commodities, ships, and people on the islands, torturing several and violating the VOC English East India Company Agreement. He then imported slaves and colonists to work the plantations. Cohen received a minor scolding from the Council of Seventeen, and a bonus of 3,000 guilders for securing the VOC's monopoly on Banda Nutmeg and Mace. Everything settled, and then Cohen decided to return to the Netherlands to enjoy the wealth he had accumulated. But, in 1623, before sailing for Batavia and then to Amsterdam, he visited Fort Victoria on Amben and warned Herman van Spult, the local governor of VOC, to be wary of suspicious English activity. 
Cohen was certain that there would be retaliation against the Banda Island incidents. Acting on advice, Spuelt concluded the unjust, cruel, and barbarous proceedings against the English in Amboina on the pretext of planning an attack on Dutch settlements, and cruelly beheaded the ten Englishmen, nine Japanese, and a resident Portuguese native on March 9, 1623, in what is infamously known as the Massacre of Ambonia. Although, it was just another bloody episode happening in Indonesia, its echo had propaganda value in Europe for centuries to come. In Batavia, he arranged the settlement of the now depopulated Banda Islands and completely eradicated the nutmeg trees on most other islands, before dividing the remaining plantations into 68 1.2 hectare per ken, which the company would then lease to Dutch planters in exchange for 1122 of the nutmeg's Amsterdam selling price, which was apparently enough, particularly given the low wages and slave labor. Enormous profits were to be made not only for the company but also for the Perkineers who in the following decades commissioned opulent estate mansions to highlight their wealth and status as landowners. In Netherland, Cohen became the head of the VOC in Horn and lived comfortably after marrying the daughter of one of the VOC's top directors, and moving into a splendid residence appropriate for an affluent individual. But his commercial ideas slowly became known in Europe, and many Dutch feared retribution for his company. However, as its operations abroad were not subject to Dutch law and the company's revenues were huge, no one really challenged the VOC's monopoly. After significant controversy, Cohen was appointed again as Governor-General of the East in 1624. He arrived late in Batavia in 1627. Sultan Agung of Mataram, the then burgeoning Javanese Empire, threatened him at Batavia with long, deadly sieges. Cohen proved to be a cunning and dangerous foe once more. The VOC, being the most powerful naval force in the region, destroyed all of Agung's grain barges in the sea, restricting supplies and starving the Orgung fighters. Finally, Agung's forces retreated, leaving dead bodies behind. The VOC's hegemony in the region had been firmly established. Unfortunately, Cohen died of cholera in his fortress on September 20, 1629, during the siege. The Dutch became the most powerful military force in the Indonesian trade, and after a six-year naval blockade of the strait, the company ultimately took Portuguese Malacca in 1641. The city and sultanate of Bantam capitulated in 1684. The VOC continued its fight with the English East India Company, which was primarily focused on India's west coast. However, there were spillovers in European waters as well as in North American waters involving the Dutch West India Company. To control production and keep prices high, VOC troops uprooted nutmeg and clove trees that were growing outside the approved plantations. Tidor and Ternate were forbidden to grow any clove, previously their sole source of income, and planting a clove tree became an offence punishable by death. VOC dominated Europe, controlling half of foreign trade by mid century. By the late 17th century, VOC was the world's largest, richest, and most powerful multinational enterprise, trading from the Red Sea to Japan and sending over a million Europeans to Asia, resulting in cultural interchange. The company directly employed tens of thousands of people when the Dutch population was only 2 million. Its navy dwarfed that of numerous nations. Yet there were troubles brewing. The corporation became fat, corrupt, and ineffective, and in the following century it had numerous adventures, successes, and failures. It was always at war, maintaining fleets, forts, and garrisons, which drained its income. Its Asian leaders became corrupt, and it went bankrupt in 1799, during the Napoleonic War. The company's success and ultimate failure were based on the dream of its greatest merchant king, Cohen, a brilliant strategist and logistician. However, either due to hyper-competitiveness or because he saw the world as a chessboard with pieces to move, he gambled and made sacrifices without much regard for human life. For Cohen, winning meant everything. He was once a Dutch national hero for stabilizing the VOC, but his cruelty and violence, as well as the VOC's corporate culture, overshadowed him. Cohen's VOC vision created amazing things for the company and for his small nation, but despite the company's monopoly, Running the spiceries became too expensive, and along with the company, the Dutch Golden Age also faded. <laughs>